Good afternoon, happy Pride, and welcome to today's discussion about the impact of policing on Black LGBTQ plus people. My name is Donald Gatlin. I'm a director at the Raven Group and moderator for this important conversation. This virtual event is brought to you by the members of the Raven Group's LGBT Strategies Practice Group, a collection of Raven colleagues organized to seek new ways to help advance the movement for greater equality. We were already planning for Pride to be different this year because of COVID-19, but nobody could have anticipated the extraordinary moment of activism ushered in by George Floyd's killing, finally calling for an end to police violence against Black people in America. That this moment is coinciding with Pride is particularly salient for the LGBTQ community. At the same time that we commemorate the uprisings queer and trans people of color led to get us where we are today, I don't think anybody can deny that the community as a whole can do more to address the challenges queer and trans people of color continue to face because of racism. One of those challenges is over-policing. The intersectional existence of Black LGBTQ people exacerbates the dangers they face in a criminal justice system fraught with racism, homophobia, and transphobia. Today's discussion will explore the policing practices impacting Black LGBTQ people, the inclusive policy solutions that address them, and the movement building strategies that can help spur the change we need. Before we get started, please note that we will take questions at the end of the discussion. Uh, you may enter yours in the comment box at any time. And with that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. With us today, we have uh, David Johns. David is the executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition. He's a recognized thought leader and social justice champion whose career has focused on improving life outcomes and opportunities for black people He's worked at the White House and on Capitol Hill, and he's been a teacher and professor among many other notable accomplish accomplishments. Welcome, David. Thank you for having uh, me. Janetta Johnson. Janetta is the executive director of the TGI Justice Project. She is a formerly incarcerated black transgender woman and has been an activist and advocate in the transgender communities. Among her many accomplishments, Janetta co-founded the Compton's Transgender Cultural District in San Francisco. Uh, it's the first transgender cultural district in the country. Welcome, Janetta. Thank you. And finally, we have Andrea Ritchie. Andrea, Andrea, excuse me, is a black lesbian immigrant, police misconduct attorney, and organizer whose writing, litigation, and advocacy has focused on policing and criminalization of women and LGBTQ people of color for the past two decades. She is a national recognized expert and sought after commentator on policing issues. Um, and she works with groups across the country to support campaigns to end policing, uh, police violence, criminalization, mass incarceration and deportation. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. So we are, I am excited um, to jump right into this conversation. I know everyone is on to, to hear you more than they're on to hear me. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in um, and start with you, Andrea, to help us level set a little bit on where we are now. Um, you're obviously an expert on policing and police violence against women and LGBTQ people of color. Um, we're in this moment today um, in part because um, the law and order policing that the president keeps calling for has failed to keep black people safe. Um, what is law and order policing and why is it particularly problematic for LGBTQ people of color? Thanks for asking. I definitely want to first acknowledge that I am one of um, three amazing experts on this panel and that I've learned so much, particularly from Ms. Janetta Johnson and David Johns and um, many folks uh, in community here. So what I'm uh, sharing is, is what I've learned. and. What I've learned in um, the course of the research that I've done is that the law and order that we're talking about is the or is about main, is using the law to maintain the social and political and economic order that this country was founded on, which is one rooted in slavery and anti-blackness, in colonialism and genocide of indigenous peoples, in um, shutting down and um, containing workers, immigrant workers, um, and 
uh, limiting workers' rights, but also one that is explicitly created around the policing of gender and sexuality, that some of the first policing forces um, in the U.S., in addition to being slave patrols and what were called Indian patrols and private union-busting police, were city municipal forces who were charged with policing literally the lines of gender, charged with policing people's clothing, people's sexual behavior, um, and framing and projecting sexual and uh, gender deviance onto uh, black and brown bodies and then criminalizing them as a result. So the order that the authorities are calling for is one that is destined to criminalize, surveil police and punish us and subject us to the kind of violence that the process of criminalization creates, which is that once you designate someone, uh, someone's existence, someone's behavior as criminal or criminalized, then police are licensed to do anything to them. So a law and order agenda has never been about protecting black LGBTQ lives and certainly has been always about policing, surveilling and punishing us and, and keeping us outside the scope of protection. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Jeanette, I'm gonna come to you next. Um, so transgender people are disproportionately challenged by violence, homelessness, and poverty. Um, they're more likely to interact with police because of these circumstances, but most feel uncomfortable calling for uh, calling the police for help when they need it. How does that dynamic play out for trans women and men of color specifically? Um, part of it could be like like really socioeconomic equity, a large part of where trans people live we live in neighborhoods that are really not safe for us and it just puts us at a high level of risk it puts us at a high level of risk of uh, uh, being profiled because sometimes we stand out in a way that the police um, target us and um, it's just um, it's it's very um, difficult to understand, you know, the different responses that you receive as a trans person, opposed to when you are perceived more as like cis passing person, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the level of violence that you would experience um, as a trans person. So it's just, um, and it's not just that part, because there's many, many dynamics to this in terms of being older and having so many experiences, seeing so many dynamics where trans people have been harmed and people always have these unjustly reasons. The cops always have these unjustly reasons. And I think about, I think about Tony McDade and I want to really um, lift him up in this conversation because he is a black trans person and a lot of times, especially, you know, you hear a lot of black trans men, trans people say that, you know, black trans men are, are, are often overlooked. And it's just like, I mean, that's great that, um, that um, like um, George Floyd and his family, you know, that whole thing that happened, it's sad that it happened, but it became a monumental movement for black lives, uh, you know, and um, it's just like, we need to be more inclusive and include Tony McDay in that same, um, you know, way of thinking and moving around the world and responding to various situations that happen to the in this capacity to further enhance and, and, and name that. That's why it's so important for us to um, just defund the police and dismantle the whole system. And um, I don't believe in reform. I believe get rid of the whole system. I don't. I just feel like we don't need the police to over oversee us. We don't. We don't need police, and we don't need jails and prisons. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that, Janetta and, and David. Um, you know, I know that among the many things that NBJC does, um, policy advocacy and youth empowerment are central focuses of your work. Um, how have Black LGBTQ youth been impacted by policing practices today? Um, and, and what have been the gaps in public policy that have allowed bad policing to persist? 
Yeah, I appreciate the question and appreciate the community um, have uh, studied the work of uh, Andrea and Janetta for some time and appreciate all that they do. So I want to say thank you for making space, uh, you Donald and everybody at the Raven Group. Um, I want to uh, underscore everything that Ms. Janetta said um, and really make clear that um, I wrote down a few of the things that she mentioned when answering your question, which was specific and inviting her to speak trans, right, which is one of the languages that she speaks. Um, and she talked about uh, being unsafe, um, overlooked, uh, fearing the police, and very much connected to what Andrea said, uh, uh, being controlled and surveilled by these systems and these people who have symbols that affirm their um, privilege, e.g. a badge and a gun. Um, and all of those things are um, often shared experiences for people who have skin that has been kissed by the sun, right? I'm talking about Black people in all of our beautiful diversity. What is often missed, and of course you didn't miss it, Donald being someone who is a member of our community and who has this competence, um, is that as long as there have been Black people, there had been Black, LGBTQIA+, whatever you want to call them people, right? We existed in this way before the terms were created, which people take for granted, right? Not even acknowledging that heterosexual and homosexual were terms that were created and fairly recently. And so specific to our babies, it is often the case that educators, uh, practitioners, policymakers, and many parents, quite frankly, assume that if your child is black, that, that they are uh, heterosexual or heteronormative. There is often no queer possibilities for them. Um, and then conversely, when kids are thought to be queer, they are assumed to be white. This was my experience for nearly a decade when I worked in the Senate on the Help Committee. Whenever groups came to lobby us about issues concerning black kids, there, were, there was never an acknowledgement that there were kids who were black and queer, black and trans, or black and non-binary. And conversely, whenever HRC or Glisten or the Trevor Project came to live on behalf of queer kids and their needs, there was an assumption that they were all white. And what happens is that the needs of our babies are missed. They're missed by design because we don't have data sets that allow kids to safely talk about their experiences having multiple marginalized identities. For example, what it means to be non-native and have a disability hidden or visible, right? What it means to be black and LGBTQIA plus P or however they might deal with it. And our babies also have to do with the additional stigma, not only racism, but homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and trans massage noir, which is a unique way that all of those things affect black trans women. What we know about youth now is that before COVID, black kids' mental health was in a state of crisis. We worked on a report with the Congressional Black Caucus last uh, winter because for the last two decades, the suicide rates amongst black youth have doubled. They've increased when in fact for every other community of children they have decreased. This is before COVID. Since COVID, we have seen an increase in the number of calls because students are talking about feeling isolation, depression, right? Uh, uh, d imagine what it means for us to develop kids in such a way where they uh, expect to say goodbye to their friends at the end of the school year. Or for, for 12 years of your school age life, you are taught that you're gonna have rites of passages like graduation and prom and to have those things ripped away from you. And we as adults aren't even talking about that kind of stuff. Um, and so one thing is mental health, right? We also know that LGBTQ youth who are also children of color face a challenge when they are forced to be quarantined in homes that are not safe and affirming or they risk being pushed out. We know in places like LA that more than 70% uh, of the young people who are homeless are both racial and ethnic sexual minority students. And so there's a lack of safe spaces for our kids to show up in. Right? And then the last thing is spe not specific to Black LGBTQ youth or LGBTQ youth of color, although I want to be clear and caring uh, uh, specifically about Black LGBTQ youth, um, is that we are not having conversations about educational inequities and how those gaps have been exacerbated, not only by COVID, but by all of the other uh, current economic and political crises that we're experiencing. Thank you, David. Um, I want to give anybody who wants to a chance to respond to anything that's already been said. The next question I'm going to pose is, is to all of you, but I don't want to um, stifle anybody's response if you if you had something burning that you wanted to, to mention. Um, I wanted to talk about when you talk about mental health and when you talk about um, Black trans safety and, and, and safe space, um, talk about how Black trans-led organizations and Black-led organizations are so underfunded and that basically we are so exhausted trying to hold so much and do too many things and it's based on our like, survival and our existence and to create other opportunities for um uh trans 
to the LGBTQ folks. And it's like, um, it's like, I feel like systemically we are not supported so we could never be sustained. And we will always have to, we will always be ex- extremely exhausted at the end of the day, at the end of the week, because we have to work extra hard to fill all these different gaps that we don't have the funding to. And when you mm-hmm. have the ex- executive director and the director of housing and supported services, like, I mean, doing like frontline work and doing case management and holding 28 trans people, um, black and brown trans um, people and their partners during this pandemic. And you're going to hotels every week to book them into hotels. And then it's like the discrimination that trans people face throughout this whole period of getting into hotels and having to spend the whole day to find a hotel that would even rent to black trans people during this pandemic. And take and turning a fifty dollar deposit into a two hundred dollar deposit, two hundred and fifty dollar deposit, and having trans people mm. versus trans people that have luggage versus trans people have one of those little black carts that a lot of people um carry to br- put groceries in. Um, like when I went in with pe- trans people that had luggage, their deposit was a hundred dollars. I go in with trans people that have one of those carts. Their deposit is two hundred dollars, and it's just it just keeps going on and on, and it's just we trans people need to be funded a lot better, um, and also trans black trans people need some capital, and uh, I think about all the black trans led organizations in the south. I don't see why they can't own their own building. You know what I mean. I don't see why they can't own their own space. That I mean, it's just like we got to figure out how to make sure that trans people are a lot safer. And it's going to require capital because at some point we're going to have to stand on our own. But, you know, we don't have that type of we don't have that type of capital. You know, we don't have that within our community to organize in that way. And how do we make that happen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, obviously, you know, super important and i think related to this next question i'm going to pose to all of you um you know we've heard the stories about black non-lgbtq men black straight men um and their and their interactions with the police um in many cases fatal interactions with the police um but we don't hear about these stories um as they relate to to black lgbtq people very often um, you know, certainly not to the level of detail that you were you were just describing, um, Janetta. But um, you know, obviously, um, you know, there's there's a there's a tremendous amount of police violence that Black LGBTQ people are facing. Why is it that we don't hear more about these stories? I, it's re- okay. I think there are I mean, a number of reasons. I'm sorry, go for. It. I don't want to. No, you go. I, there are a number of reasons, right? It's not lost to me, uh, Donald, that even in your introduction, you named George Floyd, right? Uh, and, and I think some of that is that uh, people don't appreciate that these moments that matter are connected to a longer movement, right? It should be lost on no one that we're having this conversation at Pride Month and that there would not be a Pride Month or Stonewall or anything if it were not for Marsha B. Johnson a black trans woman who existed before the term was created, but is often a race when we talk about the gains that the white queer movement likes to celebrate and claim as their own. And so the short answer I think to this and to probably every question that you're gonna ask is white supremacy. It's a function of how, you know, what black feminists refer to as the sign systems and symbols that allow this nations of domination to work and, and, and allow these things to be created, legitimized and be invisible at the same time. Um, it, it, it is also because uh, cis, hetero, black folks or, or black folks that have access to those privileges who can pass, to use a term that someone else offered, have not had to build up the reflexive uh, language and knowledge and competence to do so. They're not connected to community. They're, they're not introduced to individuals who, who, who some of us now just shared a statement about Brayla Stone, a 17-year-old black trans girl who was murdered in Arkansas, right? Like, um, uh, uh, we, we have not as a community created the space for us to have conversations about intersectionality, 
um, not just about uh, 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 intersectionality with regard to sexual identity, gender orientation, or gender expression. Hell, we don't even talk about Black people that have disabilities. Um, and so I think, again, it, it, it is one by design. I think that's the point that I'm trying to make, and I just want to say it that way. It is, by, it is by design. It is a function of white supremacy. It is a product of the flattening of race. Uh, 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 it is why we talk about black and white as if those are the only two things and 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 forget that there are Afro-Caribbeans and Afro-Latinx people and people that, again, show up with intersectional identities. Um, and because we have not gotten to the point as a community um, of holding each other accountable. And again, it's, I want to be clear as I talk about the community that there's not a single community that has ever gotten along, uh, met and had a convention and agreed on an agenda uh, and so I don't have I, idyllic expectations about what it is that we can do, but appreciating that we are often connected by this linked fate uh, that very much is anchored by the oppression that Andrea talked about when we started this conversation. We have more of an incentive and an obligation to work better together and hold space for each other. I think I definitely agree with everything David just said and would just add that the 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 story of state violence has been constructed around the experiences of black cisgender uh, heterosexual men, even as, you know, as we saw in the case of Tony McDade, the, the same forms of violence are happening simultaneously and in public view against black trans folks, whether it's Tony McDade or uh, against black trans women like Kiwi Herring, who was killed by police in St. Louis, um, which was an epicenter of uprising post Ferguson, whether it's Kayla Moore, who also was suffocated by police um, in her own home who were responding to a call for help. Um, the exact same things happen um, to, to black queer folks that, that don't get lifted up in the same way. And in part, it's because of the invisibility of any form of state violence that doesn't center the sort of commonly understood protagonist. And also because if we had to contend with state violence against black LGBTQ people, we would also have to contend with the violence that happens in our communities. And that is something that people are reluctant to do. So you can't talk about the fact uh, that Tony McDade was killed by police unless you also talk about the fact that to the earlier question you posed to Ms. Janetta, Tony McDade experienced a horrific transphobic attack the day before and was not protected by police. And the only response by police was to kill him. And um, so we would have to talk about the full circle of violence that black queer folks experience at the hands of white supremacists, at the hands of police and at the hands of black communities enforcing cis heteropatriarchy. And so, um, and other communities doing the same. So I think we would need to look at that. And the last thing I would say is that the people who would normally call attention to police violence against uh, LGBTQ or people who would normally call attention to violence against LGBTQ people like the HRCs and the uh, GLADs and so forth are deeply invested in police as the answer to violence against LGBTQ people. And we're seeing people double down on increasing hate crime penalties, increasing policing for hate crimes. And therefore it doesn't serve their purpose to then talk about police as perpetrators of homophobic and transphobic violence, police as primary perpetrators of, of hate crimes against LGBTQ people. So there's a lot of sort of conspiracy to silence um, in addition to the fact that policing is supposed to be about containing, controlling um, and punishing black queer bodies. Mm. And for folks knowing the audience uh, and acknowledging that a number of folks work in domestic policy and are thinking about, uh, may, should be thinking about parallels in schools, we see a similar phenomenon when we think about the overemphasis of the experiences of black boys in schools, right? Many people can recite uh, by heart the statistic that we used a lot of the Obama administration that for every one white boy suspended or expelled K through 12, the rate is three times higher for black boys few people still stop to ask about the experiences of black girls in schools, and we know that the rate is six times higher for them. We saw most recently when Mitch McConnell stood before the United States Senate and asked for a commission to study race because it wasn't until uh, <laughs> the magical Negro of Senator Scott told him about it, uh, that he then also talked about a commission focused on black boys. That is by design, it is by design because uh, if we call out um, the challenges facing uh, women, we have to talk about uh, the ways in which white men often oppress uh, women, uh, not just black women, right? And so I just wanna mm -hmm. highlight that these parallels exist in non-queer spaces and are otherwise complicated and that we need to make space to talk about all of them. I, I just really, I really, really, and I'm going to be very brief. I really think that there is just not enough safe spaces and there's not enough safe um, opportunity for trans people 
T L G B T Q folks to um, even develop ourselves because we are always on this survival mode for our existence and our safety and it's just like it prevents us from organizing in the way that we need to organize in order to overthrow all the stuff that we're going through and really really take out and look at like stronger policies for safety for black trans people because if I, I think about all the black trans leaders that I know that are EDs and you know, sitting at the policy table. We're, we mm -hmm. are so stretched thin and trying to be everywhere to make things better for the trans community. And it's just like, it, it's really difficult, you know, especially when you got EDs doing frontline work. It's just like, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. And I want, you know, now we're gonna move into the next sort of portion of this conversation, which is really focused on solutions. Um, so I'm glad you raised that point, Janetta. Um, uh, you know, really thinking about how can we design a, a policing system that will actually keep Black LGBTQ people safe. Um, Andrea, you know, what do, what do you think we need? Do we really need? I don't, our answer is going to be sure is that you don't have a police system. If the goal is to have us be safe, then there is no police. Well, we that ask, question. Do we need to get rid of the police altogether? What is Janetta yes, said? Move to the That's next question. <laughs> what is Janetta said? This, she said it at the beginning, she said it, no, I mean, I couldn't yeah. say it any better. It, that the police have never been safety for black queer folks. And what they do is they loot money from black trans communities. That's what they do. The looters are police. The things that Ms. Janetta has been talking about that black trans communities and organizations need for safety and to be able to not constantly be in the mode of survival or defense or trying to just stay alive another day mm -hmm. um, are things that we, currently aren't paying for because the police departments of this country are taking budgets of, you know, 50 to 70 percent of city budgets. So police departments are the ones looting what black trans people need to be safe. And that's what this defund um, police demand, which is ultimately a step towards um, abolishing police departments and actually creating a society that has the safety of black trans women at its center, which would then make all of us safe. That's the direction that we need to go in, and it needs to understand. And the first thing we need to do is do exactly what Ms. Janetta is saying: is invest in Black trans people, and invest in Black trans leadership, and invest in Black trans safety and institutions and safe spaces. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's where we start on a on road where we're actually talking about public safety and not about um, a system of policing that is not about over policing. It's doing exactly the right amount of policing from its perspective, um, and from our perspective is. All, any policing is too much policing for us. And the conversation has to start and stay there for a while because anything else is a concession that we're not really interested in the safety of those who are most vulnerable, right? I wanna highlight three things that have happened in the course of this conversation. Uh, a step before even talking about as we should abolishing the police is even acknowledging that words matter, there's power and precision. And twice Ms. Janetta has, has used TLGBQ right an acknowledgement of the fact that even when we have these conversations we privilege gay white men by putting gay first and center right and so even us thinking about language is a powerful way for us to shift a second thing is there have been a lot of folks a lot of my white gay peers who have championed the most recent SCOTUS decision around title seven and yes it is important to have a federal law that says you cannot because you should not fire people based on actual or perceived sexual identity, gender orientation, or expression. However, comma, when we talk about the average life expectancy of black trans women not exceeding that of 40 years old, we go find a citation, or the reality that is, it, it is extremely hard if possible at all for black trans women or non-binary folks to get hired, the fact that there's a law to protect them if they were to be fired doesn't really matter much, right? And so we have to be having conversations that acknowledge the realities of people's experiences based on the collusion of race and racism, anti-blackness, transphobia, and all these other things. And unless and until we start with taking away the systems, the policing system being primary, right, as it exists in our communities and in our schools, we will always concede that we don't want black queer people to be safe. Um, I, you know, I'd love to, to get a little bit deeper into um, the deep fund the police conversation and, and um, some of the specifics there, um, because while I understand that ultimately we want to abolish, we want to, to abolish police, um, you know, do we do our, 
has is the movement already inclusive enough um, on defund as it relates to our people? Um, and if not, sort of what's missing? Um, you know, how do we get to the right place? Um, I think that's a really important question. I think for more information, if folks are looking, um, a group of us put together um, a toolkit at interruptingcriminalization.com that really sort of lays out what we mean when we say defund the police and, and what our ultimate goal is and what some of the elements of that strategy are. It's not just a budgetary exercise. It's actually about um, shrinking the size, uh, the budget, but also the size, the scope, the power, the equipment, and the legitimacy of policing as something that is connected to public safety as opposed to violence um, and abandoning people like Tony McDade and all the black trans women whose names um, we could list the 14 who have been killed so far this year, um, others who have been beaten and, and left to abandon to violence. Um, and then it's also a question of investing, right? And I think that's the piece where we might be missing not only um, the experiences and needs of black LGBTQ people, but also disabled communities, um, migrant communities and so forth. So we're talking broadly about investing in housing or broadly about investing in healthcare or broadly about investing in um, community-based responses to violence. But we have to recognize that our communities are also spaces of violence for black trans people and queer folks. Um, and that if we are looking for housing, we need to make sure that housing is safe for black trans folks and black queer folks. Um, we need to make sure that if we're looking for mental health services, if those are not mental health services that police and punish gender nonconformity um, or homosexuality or um, that fail queer youth in the ways that David was talking about earlier, we have to make sure that the healthcare that we're offering is inclusive and comprehensive and non-punitive and non-surveilling and non-gender policing. So there's so many ways in that when we're thinking about the investments that we need to keep the, again, the black, the lives of black trans and queer folks at the center. Um, and that when we're thinking about community-based responses to violence that are about prevention and intervention, that means that it can't just be a, a violence prevention and intervention model that's focused one around black cishet men and gang violence or street violence or what's framed as gun violence, et cetera, um, or the experiences of white cishet women who experience domestic violence or sexual assault, right? That we have to be framing our community-based responses to violence prevention and intervention around, again, the experiences of black queer folks, which might require a lot more thought and um, resources and much more mm -hmm. transformation in our communities. Um, David, I want to go to you on a, you know, put your Capitol Hill hat back on for a second. You know, we, the House has, has passed a bill to reform policing. The Senate has one of their own. Um, you know, is, is this a turning point on the Hill or is it just run of the mill politics? What's your, what's your sense? The latter. The movement. The latter. <laughs> the latter. Okay. The latter. It, 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 it will be, yeah. it'll be, it'll be significant and noteworthy when uh, Mitch McConnell is no longer um, leading the body and or um, senators are actually forced to um, are held accountable for responding to the needs of their constituents and not necessarily their politics. Um, and so, no, I, I don't know that I will ever be able to uh, unremember watching Mitch McConnell, um, who has posed in front of Confederate flags and made arguments against the rights of Black people, um, literally say that uh, it was not until this year, in 2020, that he was made to understand that there is a problem around race um, mm -hmm. and to ask with a straight face for 18 months to study it. Um, and so I say all of that to say that, no, that, that they are playing the game that they design um, and that they plan to win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To just add to that, I, I, the, I think what we've learned, if anything, if not over the past many decades and even centuries, but certainly over the past um, five years since, or six years since Ferguson, is that policy change on paper does not produce change in police practice, right? And so, you know, we went through a process post-Ferguson, there was a president's task force on 21st century policing, it's hundreds of pages long of recommendations to reduce the violence of policing, improve policing, and uh, many of those recommendations are, are things that are in the the act that legislation that's 
passed and being considered. And Minneapolis, frankly, had many of those policies in place. It had civilian oversight. It had de-escalation training. It had many of the things that are being advanced now as solutions. Um, mm -hmm. And that those didn't prevent the death of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Tony McDade or the 120 people who have been killed since George Floyd was killed by police. And so um, it feels like we're continuing to retread the same um, sort of paper reforms that are not producing change in, in practice and, and on the streets and in terms of saving and defending black lives. And so I'm not sure why we're, we're still revisiting things that have been proven to not work. This is the time for the solutions of the future, not for to retread the solutions of the past. And I just also wanna point out that a lot of the stuff that's in the current legislation is completely unenforceable. We are mm -hmm. relying on the Department mm -hmm. of Justice to take away 5% of funding from people who don't make a change on paper. Um, to their policy around use of force or um, uh, or, or no-knock raids, for instance. Uh, the Department of Justice has already said explicitly that it will not enforce the consent decrees that it itself litigated to bring um, uh, into court. And so why would they enforce something that's a funding condition, um, which they have traditionally not enforced at all, um, particularly this uh, Department of Justice? And, and why should we trust even a future Department of Justice to do that? So... I, I'm, I'm very concerned at how much energy we're spending on legislation that will do nothing to prevent the next death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and certainly not of Tony McDade, that will not prevent um, the death of the young woman who was killed in Arkansas, that will not prevent the beatings and-, and Brayla. Uh, Brayla, um, yes, thank you. And the, the beatings of um, you know black trans folks every day, all day by police and in community. So I'm- I'm concerned about how much energy we're expending here when we could be expending energy to really rethink public safety in a way that will actually save and defend black lives. Especially given that we are 126 days away from an election. Right, yeah. Um, want to- Someone uh, asked in the chat, Donald, a question about um, same gender loving. Do we have time to, can I jump on that really quickly or you want to pose another yeah, one? Yeah, of there? course. The yeah. question is, what about the label SGL? Um, I know many uh, Black LGBTQ SGL people see this label as being seen and not visible on so many levels. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the term same gender loving was created by Cleo Monago. Uh, he and I will be talking uh, tonight at NBJC on the move um, at eight o'clock for anybody that wants to jump in. And he and I are gonna talk about this. The thing that I think is really important to acknowledge is that um, in so many other languages that are native to um, uh, the descendants of the diaspora, there is not an affirming way to talk about being both black and queer with regard to sexual identity, gender orientation or expression. It is the reason, um, in addition to troubling uh, gay as a white gay male political identifier that I use the term. Um, I do wanna acknowledge that I think a lot of it has to do with generations um, and there are more younger people that um, uh, uh, relish in that term or, or other terms like they, them and, and Z, them and there, um, but acknowledging that it exists um, is important. Thank and you, while we're while we're in the chat questions, I yeah, love please. this one about decriminalizing sex work and protecting sex workers as part of abolishing police. Um, and I I'm very excited to hear that uh, Ms. Janetta's thoughts on that. What I would point to in terms of legislative um, federal legislative opportunities, you know, Ayanna um, Presley's People's Justice Guarantee to me offers um, a much more um, comprehensive and effective roadmap to what would decrease police violence against black LGBTQ people. And in that um, People's Justice Guarantee, she calls for the full decriminalization of uh, the sex trades and to invest resources into people who are currently trading sex to survive into the things that will keep them safe if they choose to continue to do that and will enable them to do um, to meet their needs other ways if, if they so choose. And so, um, and repealing FOSTA, SESTA, which is a very harmful piece of legislation where it comes to um, black trans folks in the sex trade being able, or black queer folks generally in the sex trade being able to protect themselves um, by working um, in a safer way offline would be a, an important first step to that. So those are my thoughts on that question, but Ms. Janetta is the, is the expert in terms of TGIJP has been leading the way on that demand for a long time. Um, uh, I, um, I was thinking, I, I, when this decrim comes up, I always think about street-based sex workers, specifically street-based sex workers that are um, struggling in some ways that a lot of people that do sex work don't, that um, 
have live in neighborhoods where you know they don't have access to um um the good johns that could help a sex worker go to college and do different things and all that stuff so i, I always empathize when i think about like street-based sex worker but i i believe in these them that i just got, i'm not sure as if it is as inclusive as it needs to be in terms of um, street-based sex worker and making sure that, like, um, making sure that they get an opportunity to um, just create better um, and safer routes to do what they need to do. Um, and sex work is not always about survival. It's, uh, it's just about some people just enjoy doing sex work. And, and that's okay, but how do we protect them and how do we, um, like, I don't necessarily have the solution, but when it comes to decrim, it just makes me nervous about um, street-based sex workers. And it kind of makes me wonder how much more violence would be perpetuated on um, street-based sex worker, especially, yeah. I think that goes back to the beginning of our conversation about like when certain bodies or communities are criminalized by law and by design, then deep taking away one law that criminalizes those bodies won't necessarily end the criminalization, right? That that in places where sex work has been decriminalized, you know, black trans women on the street are going to be criminalized ten million other ways, right? There used to be um, laws against cross dressing; those were decriminalized. Now police use the laws around street-based prostitution to criminalize black trans women in the same way. If we take away those laws, they'll use other public order laws. So it does speak more to this larger demand of defunding the police, but also taking away their power means taking away the laws that they can use. But I, I completely agree that we need to look at that issue more holistically. Excellent. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the siloing of movements and, and what we can do, you know, to, to try to foster more collaboration between um, the LGBTQ advocacy um, movement and and the movement for, for criminal justice reform, if any. Um, it's sort of more of an open-ended question, but my sense of it is that there isn't enough collaboration there um, or that there could be more. Welcome any thoughts on that on that topic. I think I'll, I'll, yes, go ahead. Can I just say one quick thing? When, when people mention criminal justice reform, they scare me and I just, I, I'm afraid because I'm like, in my mind, you're still trying to lock me up. You're still mm -hmm. trying to find a way to enslave me, put me in a cage and tell me I'm not good enough. So that's profit a from me. topic for me. I appreciate that. Thank you. Exactly. Um, and there are, um, there's increasingly, I think all three of us are members of an LGBT criminal justice working group at the federal level who have been trying to reduce harms of incarceration and policing um, as experienced by LGBTQ people and who I think are increasingly um, moving towards the notion that those harms cannot be reduced, even as we're building a different thing, even as we're moving towards decriminalization, decarceration, defunding, and building new systems of safety for Black LGBTQ people. I think what we've learned is, particularly at the federal level, it's just nonstop betrayal, right? And nonstop um, harm of the kind that Ms. Jenna is talking about, right? Having a policy at the Bureau of Prisons that says that trans people should be housed um, according to what makes them feel safest is again, only a policy on paper and it presumes the incarceration of trans people <laughs> to start with. And so that we really need to just back up and be like, trans people should not be incarcerated. Um, so we shouldn't be trying to figure out how to house them in a system that's inherently violent, right? Yeah, and at the risk of being persnickety, I, th I also wanna underscore that Andrea acknowledged and answered your question that there are many of us who do this work who work in coalition. Um, and work across coalitions, right? Because this affects us in so many different ways. Somebody in the chat also asked about intersections around uh, disability and, and mental health and, and other issues, things that I've named, but we could also talk about and, and, and go deeper around. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there are always opportunities for progressive, white-led, white-queer-led organizations who suck up a lot of oxygen and who have a lot of capital to get out of the way. 
um, to participate in divesting and investing in the way that both Ms. Janetta and Andrea talked about. Uh, and then this particular moment, uh, while we've seen some of that shift, this has been a lot of my critique around corporate sponsored pride celebrations, right? Like a, a lot of the money that, that goes into having pride parades where they're rainbows and glitter, but no one acknowledges any of what we're talking about are the realities of black, queer, black, trans, black, non-binary folks is often replicated in policy spaces. And so we should be having uh, diverse conversations as it relates to how people do this work. Uh, and, and how people who are often called to speak on behalf of these communities but don't empower, definitely not black trans folks or street sex workers, um, to be at the table. Um, uh, uh, talking about that kind of shift would allow us to have a, a different way of, of imagining uh, what's possible. Mm -hmm. See, I think, I think I just want, I'm gonna say this real quick. I'm, I'm, I'm listening and I'm hearing about, you know, pride and stuff like that and all these different companies because I think about all these different banks that have all these different floats in, in the parades and spend all this money and all this money. I don't even know. I'd like to know where where did all that money go that generally people um, put use to showcase their business, which are businesses that are built on the backs of black people and slavery so it's just like like that is a conversation that we should also be having like figuring out like even if next year we're still in COVID 19 what are y'all gonna do to what are y'all gonna use that money for that you spend on these oh no oh you're, you're back, back. <laughs> the devil busy because she's talking truth exactly <laughs> exactly um yeah, I think that there's been a strong movement to kick cops out of pride um, that, you know, certainly Toronto uh, was one of the first cities to do that. DC has been very effective in pushing for that. Um, and it's a it's one, an acknowledgement that, you know, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera be rolling in their graves to see cops at pride when they're the entire sort of initial uprising that sparked um, pride parades was against police repression. So that's one thing. But secondly, that I have for 10 years, I was um, the attorney on call for Cop Watch um, at New York City Pride. And I spent every Sunday for 10 years up all night calling to get queer people out of jail um, from police who had beaten and abused them at Pride. <laughs> and it was always black trans people and wow. or black queer people. It was, and so to me, this notion, it's, it's, um, it's about how we legitimize police as supposed protectors at Pride or allies in Pride when they're in fact perpetrating violence at Pride. Um, and just how that's a microcosm of the larger questions that Ms. Janetta was raising about, you know, sort of where are we as a community investing not only our money, but also our belief in what's going to create safety for us and, and how are we creating the world that we want in the way that we're doing advocacy. And I think what David was saying is that we really need to rethink all of it. Um, from whether cops show up at Pride to whether we have panels with police about how to have better LGBT liaisons to, you know, how we um, legitimize policing in the ways that we advocate around homophobic and transphobic violence to how deeply we get behind the demands of Black communities on the front line saying we're, we're done with the system and we're not supporting this legislation. We want to defund police federally, state, local, and build a world of safety for the people Ms. Jeanette is talking about. Yeah, like there's so many people who don't appreciate that Stonewall as a bar, right, in an inn where get queer folks were gathering existed because there was a city ordinance that said that you could deny service of alcohol to queer people because there was an accepted belief that queer people, gay people couldn't handle their liquor. That's why like we congregated in the spaces where folks would serve us liquor because there was a, a law that made that possible, right? And, and the police took advantage, again, to the point of looting, police took advantage of that law and showed up in those spaces and raided them and harassed people and took money from them and took them to jail because it made money for the system. And, and, and we have to be clear about remembering these histories because the, the, the glitter and the rainbows are distractions by design. Because if we are dancing and celebrating with those who are responsible for our oppression on a particular day, the weekend then otherwise hold them accountable for the stuff that they allow their colleagues to do. And so I just want us to be better about having uh, fuller conversations and 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 
um, uh, thinking about what's possible, not based on that which has been here too far. Love it. Um, David, you, you, you mentioned this question. Um, did you want to go deeper about the intersection of disability? I don't want to um, skate over that. No, no, only to say that it's significant that the, the, you know, there's an anniversary of the 50th or 55th anniversary of the ADA is coming up next month. It's an opportunity for us to acknowledge that uh, the experience of so many African Americans, right? Uh, those who are descendants of enslaved Africans here um, have a disability. Uh, either because they were born with one or they were made to have one, often because of the process of enslavement or the the, the, the vestiges that they're in. And so uh, we could do a lot to hold more space for individuals with disabilities, not only visible disabilities, which is where we over-index, but hidden disabilities, um, and acknowledging that there are often more policy opportunities for us to talk about the connections that we're making here as well. And to add to that, I really just want to point people to um, a few websites. One is Talila L. Lewis's website, and hopefully we can get that up on the screen, um, who uh, found an organization called HERD in DC that works um, particularly with uh, deaf people who are policed and incarcerated, many of whom are queer and trans also. There is definitely an intersection there that we don't spend time on. Um, and also who has taught me so much about how ableism and anti-blackness are inherently intertwined. And so that there are ways in which um, ableism intersects with anti-blackness to, to designate all black people inherently mentally disabled or inherently physically disabled in a way that um, produces police violence. And so, and then I wanna insert into that the ways in which gender nonconformity and, and what's perceived as sexual deviance is also framed as mental illness or mental uh, disability. And that those things will all converge in how police interact with say a black trans woman who may have unmet mental health needs or may just be perceived by the officers to have unmet mental health needs by virtue of the fact that she's trans, even if she's, you know, doesn't have unmet mental health needs or isn't in a crisis in that moment. And that those kinds of things are the things that converge to kill Kayla Moore. When someone in her home thought that there should be an intervention by a mental health professional instead of a mental health professional police showed up, and they framed her and responded to her as deranged in some way that in, that's deeply rooted anti-Black ableism and also the trans misogynoir that um, David talked about earlier, where women are also inherently um, framed as hysterical and disabled. And so um, <coughs> the ableism and anti-Blackness are inextricably intertwined and inextricably drive police interactions and police violence, including and especially with Black, queer, and trans people in ways that we need to lift up and that we need to understand that until we un dis like dismantle ableism, that we're not going to be able to dismantle anti-Blackness or the police violence that comes with it. Half the people who are killed by police at least are or are perceived with a mental health crisis um, or disabled yeah. in some way. And we should all remember that it was only recently that the gay white men who allowed the APA to designate being LGBTQIA a mental disorder to change it, right? Um, and so the connections, again, that we're all making about how people use policies, laws, and access to systems are very much colored by race and uh, sexual identity and gender orientation and ability. Um, I only have, look, I think we are, I don't see any other questions. And I have um, just one more, if you will humor me on this one, it, it's a bit broad, but um, you know, please just answer however you think is most appropriate. Um, but I'm trying to get to you know, helping that person out there on the street who just feels like um, they don't have enough information to be able to be helpful. Um, you know, people who want to um, do more to, to help seize this moment, to claim a better future for black LGBTQ people, but literally just don't know where to, you know, what they should do first or how to get out of the way. You know, what would you, what would you recommend to, to people like that? Ms. Janetta. Um, I, I don't um, when I when you asked the question, the first thing that popped up in my mind, and I, I really, really have really been thinking about youth and young people, and particularly people that uh, queer and trans people that are in elementary school, and I think about art and um, cartoons and just a lot of different things. And to me, I think it would be very helpful and important if that 
um, queer and trans people that are youth that are in elementary school. And we're working on building a black trans cultural center. Uh, and a lot of it is going to contain photos of um, black trans people do, that are doing a lot of amazing work and, and empower and making sure that people have, the, especially um, trans and queer and gender nonconforming, non-binary people that are young, they need to see more faces that look like them. They need to see bodies that say, "Hey, if you like you, you have every oppor- you, you have opportunity in life. Like it's just like sometimes when you're young and you're queer or trans or gay, you feel like there's no life, there's no future for you. And a lot of times, people internalize things, and it's damaging to the mental health and the psyche." around um, self-loathing and depression. And a lot of us know um, that depression can be very, very serious and very, very like uh, this real thing that is holding you down. And I just think that those are the things that we should really start looking at as well is how does the art in the world impact um, LGBTQ communities and queer and GNC non-binary folks and mm-hmm. and I just want to paint the world with so many positive messages about our communities and, and you know and just like let everybody know that you know we're, we're, we're gifted and we're talented like a lot of people don't even get to use their gifts and talents because systemically you know people uh, are suffering from mental health issues that will probably never be addressed because nobody's willing to go out in the trenches and nobody's willing to put those people in the shower and you know support <clears throat> them and and feeling safe enough to take the risk to deal with the trauma that we have to deal with in order to move forward so i mean it's complicated and that's what your initial response uh triggered in me and kind of not in a negative way in a very positive way to feel like I, I I needed to say that that we need a lot more art. We need like ten times more art so that we can constantly be reminded that we're safe and so that we can constantly see our face and bodies in this world in more positive light. Yes. Do you want to go? Andrea, I'm not sure if you the question, I, but um, I didn't hear the question. But I'm so caught up in yeah. this vision for the world that I'm like, yes, I want to live in that world. And I think that Streamyard, um, when too much intersectionality happens, Streamyard crashes <laughs> because oh, no. and I keep getting kicked off. So that that might be what happened. Anyway, I'm joking. But um, what was the the final question? Uh, it was just it was just one final thought for people, um, you know, who want to help. Uh, but don't know sort of where to start or feeling lost um, in in the intersectionality, quite frankly, um, don't have the experience and uh, but genuinely, you know, would like to be more helpful. I think it's for people to really think about the role that policing plays in their lives and in the lives of people they care about and in their own hearts. I think that we need to defund and divest from policing um, financially, but also ideologically, and for many of us emotionally. We need to really believe in the possibility of a world where we don't have to take a system where half the people who experience domestic violence don't even call the police. And one study in Atlanta found that 67% of black trans women would never call the police. And that when they do call the police, they are the ones who are arrested and beaten, right? We want to dream a world that's that doesn't leave anyone behind who's experiencing violence. And that requires all of us to really work our imaginations and, and to and to invest our resources in the ways that Ms. Janet is talking about to say, what are we doing to put money into creating that kind of situation? What are we doing to support the leadership of people who are building that situation? And how can we share in imagining a world where all black trans people are not just safe and surviving, but thriving um, and and being able to live into their fullest human potential? And that that's work that each of us could start doing today and every day in how we think about how we resolve conflict, how we address harm and um, how we think about needs and and how they need to be filled in society and and what approaches we take. So I think each of us can be engaged in that work starting right now. And each of us could start by donating to TGIJP right now um, and donating to black trans led organizations and black trans people right now. Um, 
and thinking about how their organizations and companies can invest in the safety of black trans people immediately um, and start divesting from the things that are keeping black queer people and trans people unsafe, including police. Yeah, I, I co-sign all of that and encourage people to invest in uh, organizations that are led by the people who are, are from the communities most impacted. Um, I also see it's not lost to me that there's someone in the chat who identifies as a black woman who is a police officer, um, whose daughter is a member of our community um, and who uh, uh, clearly doesn't agree. And I'd love, I wish that there was more space for us to ask her why. Um, what does it mean to be a part of a system that was designed to enforce slavery? Um, and for us to have a conversation about that, I also think that as has been described and as exists on the website that Andrea mentioned, uh, what we're asking for is to acknowledge that experts should be funded to do what experts are experts in and the police are not uh, experts in a lot of things that they're now um, asked to do. And so the funds should go to those organizations and individuals who are experts in responding to the needs of communities. Also wanna say that I think in this moment, my biggest concern is that um, seldom are people in positions of power held accountable for their privilege. Uh, and often people rush past the discomfort, which comes from acknowledging all of the stuff that we're talking about and the discomfort of, of appreciating that there are some people who have and face uh, challenges on a daily basis that would break the average adult. And people need to sit with that, right? I think there are too many people who are black and who are able-bodied and who are cis and who are heteronormative, who are just now asking themselves why they don't have black queer friends in the same way that we tell white people that it's not enough to just have one of us. I want people to sit with how they allow themselves to exist at a point in time in which they don't celebrate the diversity that has always existed in our community. And then related to the points that I've already been made, there are organizations that have been doing this work long before it was trending and mm -hmm. who will be doing this work long after it is covered in this moment. And so I would encourage folks to find us and follow us and to seek to not do harm by not getting in the way, uh, by not making it about you, um, and by seeking to um, understand how it is that uh, you can shift power and leverage your privilege, uh, which often might require you to ask yourself why you're doing some of the things that you're doing and the relationships that you have um, so that we all can stand better together one day. Awesome. Uh, I mean, I feel like I could, I could talk to you guys forever, but we have come up on the hour. Um, so it, it is unfortunately time to end the conversation, but um, want to thank you all for, for joining us. I hope, Janetta, you can hear me. I see you're still here. Um, but want to thank all of you for, for all of the incredible insight you, you've brought to the conversation today. Um, and thank the viewers for, for joining us and listening in and being a part of this um, at this really important moment right now for the country. Um, I think it's you know hard to find a more important conversation than the one we're having right now. So um, appreciate you know, appreciate your interest um, and passion for for the for the topic as well. Thanks so much for having thank us. Thank you. Putting us on. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Andrea, Miss Janetta, for your brilliance and your leadership too. Yes, thank you. Thank My you. My pleasure.